I don't know if you've noticed, uh, Albert Schweitzer, a, a number of years ago, he wrote this quest of the historical Jesus. He wanted to find out who the historical Jesus was. And so he wanted to do all this research. And then you had the National Geographic and Time and U.S. News, all kind of wanting to rediscover or find out who is this real Jesus, the search for Jesus. What's difficult about this and the hypocrisy of all of these people doing this is they didn't go to the Bible to find out who Jesus was. Thinking somehow that they could find him apart from the scriptures is lunacy. Yes, you can study the historicity of Jesus and find out a lot of things from encyclopedias, secular books. But to know the true Jesus, God has given us a book called the Bible. We call this a holy book. And we believe it's divinely inspired. And it will help you and assist you and it will show you your need of a Savior named Jesus. Uh, so... It's not bad to do all these things, but I, I would just say, if you're doing all of this research, why not go to the Bible as well? Well, because the God of the Bible wants command of everyone that reads it. And people don't want to have somebody in command over their lives. They want to be in command of their lives. There are four verifiable historical and archaeological records of the life of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not only are they verifiable historically and archaeologically, but they are inspired by God himself so that every word is, in fact, true. Do you believe that this is God's holy, inspired word? I do, too. I think the more we believe this, the more we hold on to the truths found in God's word, the more we will look like dinosaurs in the age in which we live. People are going, oh, you believe that book? It's not true. That's not right. That's just a bunch of concocted stories by men who wanted to make a, a, a Messiah out of a man. And I'd say, just read this book. And what you'll find happening is, this book is reading you. <laughs> you'll find your name in here. You'll find your feelings in here. You'll find your experiences in here as you read God's Word. It's not bad to read other stuff, but I'd say, be a man of one book. Make sure this book is a primacy in your life. To find Jesus, you need look no further than Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It's interesting, uh, if you just took Luke, it's the longest of the four Gospels. In fact, Luke wrote more in volume than any other person in the New Testament, even Paul. If you lined up the scrolls, Luke wrote more in two books, Luke and Acts, than all the other apostles put together, even not together, apart. So Luke wrote more than all of them. This is the longest gospel. And you could probably take one chapter from Luke and you could find that Jesus is God. You wouldn't have to take the whole book. If you want to find out who Jesus is, you could take one chapter out of the book of Luke and begin to discover that Jesus is indeed God. Today, we're going to look at one paragraph. And in one paragraph, you will be able to discern that Jesus is God. Just some fun facts. Luke was a physician. It's the longest gospel, as I mentioned. He's the only Gentile writer in the New Testament. He used the word, the phrase, son of man, 23 times. That's important to him, the son of man. He also emphasized the humanity of Christ. He was human and he was divine. Jesus was 100% human and he was 100% God, the perfect God-man. He was not schizophrenic. He was not having four or five minds. He was one man. He was 100% God. 100% man. The perfect union in Jesus, the God-man. We're going to talk about that today. Luke 5, 1 through 11. If you've got your Bibles, it's a story we just watched on the screen, but I want to read it aloud to us today. Just before this, Jesus has preached. He's rejected at Nazareth. He drives out demons. He heals many people, and one of them is Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law prior to this. Then chapter 5, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, 
put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. Five quick attributes that we can see of Jesus. He's divine. It means he is deity. He is of God. Divine attributes. Here's four of them. One, he's the source of truth. He's preaching to them at the beginning of this story. He's the source of truth. Second, he, is, he shows omniscience. He knows all. He knows all. Third, omnipotence. He's all-powerful. Omni means total or all. Potent or potency has to do with power. He's all-powerful. There's nothing that God cannot do. God is all-powerful. Uh, every situation that you see, you may see five solutions, but God may see 500,000 solutions. God is powerful, and he's able to work in our midst in ways that we don't even know to accomplish his purposes. The problem is we don't always believe him. So hearing his preached word will help you to believe him. Next is his holiness. We see that. He's holy. Jesus is holy. Peter saw that very quickly in the boat. Simon Peter saw it. He's holy. And the best one of all, maybe, he's merciful. D do you ever need mercy? <laughs> we all need mercy. We all need mercy. And mercy is where God holds back from us things that we deserve. God's mercy is him holding back from us what we deserve. I deserve hell, and so do you. But God is rich in mercy, and he holds back hell from us. That's mercy. Grace is that he gives us something good we don't deserve, which is heaven. That's an easy way to think. When you think mercy, think hell. When you think grace, think heaven. God holds back from us in his mercy hell, and he gives us heaven. That is his grace to us. So these five attributes of Jesus are seen in this story. We're going to tiptoe through these together today. Capernaum, it's where Jesus is doing some of these things. Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee. That top area, that Sea of Galilee, that small little blue dot there you can see at the top of the screen, that Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long and 7 miles wide. Jesus did a lot of his ministry around the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Gennesaret. Gennesaret can also mean garden. It's a very fertile area, of course, by the water. And, and there's a certain spot there at the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee where it was, it was so flat when you came off the shore, go a long way, and the water would come up and push off, and it would water things around there, and it would be a very, very fertile area. Also a natural amphitheater, as Jesus was there by the crowd, as you come off, it's real flat, and it kind of comes up, forming this natural amphitheater for his voice to be heard by the large crowds. So they're out all night. They're out, these fishermen are out all night fishing. Uh, I'm not much of a fisherman. I, I, I'd rather not be a, a fisherman. I'd rather be a catcherman. Uh, fishing is okay, but if you're not catching, it's not much fun. I, I want to be a fisherman. I want to be a catcher, not a fisherman. And part of being a good fisherman is knowing where the fish are. Well, these fishermen, they thought they knew where they were, and they're out there on the Sea of Galilee, sea of, the Lake of Gennesaret, and they're fishing all night long. And fishermen tell me that fish do better at night. They bite better at night. It's not as hot. 
There's not much stuff to scare them. It's dark, so fish will come up toward the surface at night. And so the best fishing is at dark or through the night. And so these fishermen have been out all night long and don't have any fish stories. Haven't caught one fish. And they come back depressed. They come back sore. All they catch is some seaweed on their nets. And so the next day, they're on the shore, and they're cleaning their nets. They're getting all the seaweed off those nets. And then they'd probably sleep in the afternoons, and they'd go back out the next night, and they'd fish all night. That was the trade of a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee. It talks about these massive crowds are coming around Jesus. Massive crowds. Jesus was able to heal people. Um, you see, even on Christian television, if somebody claims to be able to heal people, they can draw 15,000 30,000, 60,000 people. They can fill a stadium if they tell people they can heal people. If you can really heal people, like Jesus did, you can have massive crowds. People come from all over. Whether they believe in God or not, they want a healing. They want a touch. They need some help in their life. Jesus is healing people. There's nothing that's too difficult for Jesus. Anybody that comes and says, Jesus, I've got an issue, he can heal it. So massive crowds. It's in Luke 5.19. It talks about these large crowds. 6.19, 8.4, 8.40, 9.11. All these verses are talking about the crowds. They just keep amassing more and more people, crowding around Jesus. In 12.1, it even says that they're crowding around each other so much that they're trampling on one another. They're stepping on each other and packing into one another like sardines. And Jesus feels this, and they keep pushing on him further and further, and he's kind of back out into the water. And they kind of just keep pushing closer and closer. And he finally signals to Simon Peter and says, hey, can I have one of your boats? Jesus wants to get in Simon's boat for another reason. But he he asks Simon for his boat. They get it ready. He gets in. So now he can kind of back out away from the the edge on the shore, and he can speak to the people. If they crowd each other, they're just getting wet. But he's in the boat. He's teaching them. He's sitting down in the boat, and he's teaching them. Remember, we said this last week, Jesus was the greatest communicator, the clearest preacher that ever walked the earth. There never was anybody who could communicate the way Jesus could. No one had such clarity of thought, grasp of the language, nor the precision in presenting truth or the perfect illustrations. Jesus was operating with the mind of God. Think about that kind of teaching. He's got the mind of God. He is God. He's teaching through human lips with human vocal cords and a human heartbeat. But he's teaching the very words of God. He's teaching them truth from on high. Can you imagine listening to Jesus teach? So there he is on shore with a mass of people coming out of towns and villages and cities. They're crowding around him and eventually pushing him. It's very important. In verse 1, it says they were listening to the word of God. Don't miss that. They're listening to the word of God. A lot of people have Bibles that might say the Word of God on them. I've got a Bible in my study. It says God's Word. The Word of God. We understand that. But in in the technical sense, it is God's Word. But what Jesus is saying here, he is giving the very Word of God. So an accurate translation is, they were listening to the Word that comes from God. As he opens his mouth, the people are getting what God thinks about. Because Jesus is speaking the words that come from God. Isn't that amazing? It's not just teaching. It's not just something he's kind of cooked up. Jesus is a vehicle. He is communicating the word that comes from God. That is important. So when Jesus spoke, who was speaking? God. This is the source of divine truth. This isn't a sermon that he put together by doing some research and some other books. You never hear in the Bible that Jesus was spending time in the library getting a sermon together. Jesus prayed and God gifted him with knowledge from heaven that he communicated on earth. And so everything Jesus was talking about, it was like people were seeing into heaven. They're getting an idea of what God thinks in heaven. Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. So Jesus is communicating the words that come from God. That's important to catch here. You're hearing me teach, and I may be an okay preacher. 
But boy, if you could hear Jesus. Oh, if you could hear Jesus. He would, he would tell you what's on God's mind. He would tell you the thoughts, the nuances of heaven as you listen to Jesus. Can you still hear Jesus? Every time you open this book, he'll speak to you. He'll tell you what heaven's thinking about. He'll tell you what God's thinking about in his holy word. Remember the Sermon on the Mount there on the northwest corner of, the, of that Sea of Gennesaret, the Lake of Gennesaret? They heard the Sermon on the Mount, and then at the end of it, they said this, He speaks as one having authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. They were all quoting people. They had footnotes in every sermon. They are always quoting somebody else. But Jesus was able to speak the words of God. So Jesus is God, God the Son, and therefore when God the Father speaks, God the Son speaks. In Hebrews, it talks about how God spoke to us through the prophets and that Jesus speaks to us through the apostles and then now the Holy Spirit speaks through the disciples on earth today. There it is. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So God is speaking to us through his word. So when I stand here behind the sacred desk and I preach to you from God's holy word, you're getting ideas that are coming from God. Me or anybody else, it's not me. It's God using a preacher, whoever, whoever, the office of preacher. Whoever God is using in this pulpit, if you'll listen, if they're preaching from God's word, you will hear God's word spoken to your heart if you'll listen. Why would you not want to hear more of God's word? Why would you lay out? Why would you say, I can't go, I've got to, I've got to you know, my, my toenail hurts. Why? Come and hear, not from me, come and hear the words that come from God. We need that, don't we? We need to have God's word washing over us all the time. John 5.24, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. These words have power. These words have power to save souls if you'll listen. <laughs> John 7.16, Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. He's the mouthpiece for God. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 42 through 44, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, he's talking to the Pharisees, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. You're getting two sources every week. There's just two sources. One source, you're getting stuff from God. The other source is you're getting stuff from the devil. There are just two kingdoms. There aren't 18. There aren't 80,000. There are just two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of Satan. If you're listening to the words that come from God, you're listening to the right kingdom. If you're listening to Satan and all his stuff, you're hearing the words of the enemy. He's speaking untruth and disaster into your lives. Satan is speaking harm into you. He's speaking harm into your relationships. He's speaking harm into your job. Satan is always lying. They, can, they say you can tell when, G, when Satan is lying. It's when his mouth is moving. He's lying all the time. And he wants to feed you a bunch of lies. But you must hear the words that come from God. So you're either a follower of God or you're a follower of Satan. Not much room to wiggle. Every person in this room is either a follower of God or a follower of Satan. Think about that. Every teenager in this room, every adult, we are either a follower of God or a follower of Satan. Jesus said in John 12, 49, For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. These are the very words of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, Paul said, By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. 
The gospel has the power to save you. I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. There's something called natural theology, and it's, it's a heresy that's coming into the church. It's the idea that you don't need Jesus. You don't hear the gospel. You don't need to hear the words of the Bible to be saved. You can get saved just out in nature. You don't even need God. That's not true. If that were the case, Jesus didn't have to come to this earth. He could have just spoken to us through the clouds and through the stars and the heavenly bodies. Nature is God's second Bible, yes. We can learn about God by looking at the heavenly bodies, but we need specific revelation. Thomas Aquinas was the guy that kind of came up with this idea that you could be saved through looking at the, the heavenly bodies. That's natural theology. So there's general and special revelation. General revelation is we all can see there's a universe, and we go, wow, it's amazing how this just happened. No, it didn't just happen. Everybody would know somebody intelligently designed this place. But you need specific or special knowledge to come to know him. That's what Paul says in Romans 10. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. We need Preaching. You need to sit under preaching, not just mine. You need to listen to preaching online. Make sure you're listening to good preachers. They're Bible-centered, Bible-focused. Make sure you're hearing God's Word wash over you. It's not bad to hear five or six sermons in a week. It's not, it's not bad for you. It's food for your soul. Some of you work in jobs where you can have an earbud in. You can put sermons on, on a podcast and listen to sermons all day long. I would say listen to truth and see what happens in your life. So verse 2 we're going to get through this somehow, some way today. Verse 2, he saw at the water's edge two boats left by the fishermen who were washing their nets. As I said, they'd do that in the day or in the morning. They'd get them all cleaned up, and then they'd put those nets back on the boat, and they'd wait until the night, and they'd go back out and fish some more. So nights for fishing, days for mending nets. Their nets would get broken. They'd get worn out. They'd have to mend those nets so that the fish would get caught in the nets. If there are big holes in the nets, the fish just pass right through. So they had to mend their nets. That's what preaching does to your life. That's what preaching is. It's mending the nets in your life. As you hear the Word of God taught from Sunday school classes or from this pulpit or other places, it's mending the net of your heart so that you can catch men. So this is a fairly large boat. It's for fishing enterprise. Uh, they, they probably have maybe 10, 12. Sometimes all the disciples are on a boat plus the fishing crew. So a pretty big boat they'd have to have to go out fishing for this. Uh, it's interesting, verse 3, what it says, that Jesus, he got into one of the boats, and one belonging to Simon, he got into that one, I think, on purpose. Because he, he wanted to bring Simon up. He, he's trying to elevate Simon in leadership. Jesus has a method to his work here. He got into the one belonging to Simon Peter, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Water is a natural conductor in the sense of amplification, I was growing up, we had an in-ground pool, and we'd get on opposite ends. It was a 40-foot long pool by 20 feet wide, and, and I'd get on one end, and my sisters would get on the other, and I would try to talk quietly, and they had to try to listen to what I was saying. And then they would return it to me, like tennis, back and forth. It was amazing. You could talk so quietly, and that your voice would just carry across that water. Isn't it funny how Jesus knew that? Like, how would he know that? I mean, this is... Oh, he made the water. I forgot. Uh, so, so Jesus knows this. He knows the principles of what he's made. And he knows if he's on the water, he can talk. And it's natural amplification to the people. Maybe thousands and thousands of people listening to him. Verses 4 and 5. Look at that with me in your Bibles. When, when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put down into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, We've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will, I will let down the nets. Master. He uses the word master here. It's a term of respect. It's a term of respect, but it's not divinity. Peter still doesn't know who Jesus is. He knows he's a good teacher, and he's doing some healings, but he doesn't know he's God. And so Peter calls him master, a term of respect. But later on down, you see where he calls him Lord. And that's a term of your God. That's verse 8. But he said, we fished all night, we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Well, 
Jesus, because you want us to. I mean, we're, both, we're plumb, tired. We need some rest. But you did heal my mother-in-law. And we did get a good meal out of the deal. So I guess I'll go ahead and put the nets out one more time. Whatever the reason is, he goes back out and he's going to put the nets down one more time. There are two types of fishing nets used in the Bible. One type of the fishing net was one that one person could use. And it's and illustrated there. It's almost like a lasso. And you could kind of swing this net and throw it out. And it would have weights on the edges of the net. And the net would sink down. And it was somebody would be maybe waist deep or just in their ankles fishing. And you just kind of do this from the shore. And it would go down and then you'd pull it. And as it pulled it, it would kind of a net, it would kind of come together and you'd catch fish that way. That's one type of net used in the Bible. The net that Jesus tells Peter to let down is not this kind of a net. Net is called a saganay or sometimes called a seine. It'd be something like this. They'd, they would get a, a, a big net and they'd put it between two boats. And sometimes these nets could be a half a mile long almost like a big volleyball net. They've got strung up between the two boats, and the boats would move together in conjunction. And as they went through the water, the fish would swim into the net. And then when they, got, when they were full, the boats would kind of begin to circle around each other, and that would tighten the net. And then when they got closer, they'd kind of make a big circle, and they'd pull the fish in. This is the kind of net that they're talking about. So whenever Peter says, Jesus, really? We just got this net in the wa- back in the boat. You want us to go back out? We're tired. But because you say, we'll do it. So they go back out. Look what happens in verse 6. That's so amazing. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. The netting is breaking. It's pulling so hard. There's so much weight in these nets that they're actually snapping. And some of the fish are probably getting away. And so what do they do? They go, oh, we're losing fish. They get over here quicker. They call the other boat. They signal, come over here. So they they get over there, and they're all beginning to scoop these fish into the boat. I mean, as fast as they could go. Isn't that interesting? They fished all night and didn't catch one thing. Jesus says, let down your nets. They let them down. They catch so many fish, they can't hardly pull them into the boat. In fact, the Bible says the boats are almost sinking with the weight of the flesh of these fish. (laughs) Wouldn't you like to take Jesus fishing? I mean, you can fish all day and not catch a thing, but Jesus says, just go over there. Okay. Whoa, a 28-pound bass. How did that happen, Jesus? Is that even possible, 28-pound bass? (laughs) Jesus knows where all the fish are. Not just in the lake Gennesaret. Jesus knows where all the fish are in all of the oceans. Jesus knows where all the fish are in the ponds, in the streams, in the creeks. Jesus knows where all the fish are everywhere. Jesus knows every fish that's ever been in the ocean. Jesus knows where every fish died in the ocean. Jesus knows where every fish went when it left the ocean. See, Jesus is omniscient. Omni, again, all or total. Science means knowledge. He has all knowledge. He has all knowledge. Everything there is to know, he knows. Mark Lowry, the Christian comedian, I've heard him say, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? God has never had to have a thought He's never had to think something through. He's never had to figure something out. God is all-knowing. He knows everything about everything. He is a jack of all trades and a master of all. He knows them all. He knows all about electricity. He knows all about masonry. He knows all about how to put a building together. He knows how to hold a universe together at his word. He's all-knowing. He knows where all the fish are. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. I looked that word up to to, to understand it, fall. I always thought it meant a dead bird. I thought it meant a bird died, a sparrow died. Down it went, God always knows the dead sparrow. But I looked it up, it actually means hop. When it falls, the word is hop in the Greek, that sparrows, they they come to the ground and they hop around looking for food. And Jesus says that God knows every time a sparrow hops, 
He knows everything. I wish God knew about my problems. Man, I wish God knew about how hard it was for me. Come on. He knows when a sparrow hops. He knows what's going on in your life. I wish God knew my misery. I wish God knew my struggles. I wish God knew all about everything. He does. He does. God cares for you. In Matthew 17, 27, remember some Pharisees came to Peter and they said, Peter, do you and your master pay taxes? He's like, yeah. Oh, man, I don't know. He went back to Jesus. Jesus, do we pay taxes? Jesus says, do the king and his sons have to pay taxes? No. But, so we don't make trouble. Peter, go down to the lake, throw your line in, pull up the first fish, and there'll be a drachma in that mouth of it. Take it out and go pay our taxes. Okay. What? I'm a fisherman. Will you tell me to go put my line and catch one fish and it's going to have our taxes in it? All right. Throws it in. Oh my. Shakes the coin out of the mouth of that fish and goes and pays her taxes. Jesus knows where that coin is in that fish's mouth, in that ocean or in that lake, and he knows where Peter's going to throw his line in and he pulls it out. I don't know if that amazes any of you. I mean, I've been, I've been amazed this week because I've studied this passage just like... God, you, you knew that I was getting ready to talk to you about this. <laughs> the next thought you're going to have, God already knows it. God knows all. He knows. He knows your pain. He knows your trouble. He knows your sin. He knows your heartache. He knows everything, and he cares. <laughs> Remember the scripture from Psalm 139? Oh, Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Man, I wish God knew what kind of job I was going to have next. I wish God knew how my marriage is going to work out. I wish God helped me with my kid. God knows. Trust Him. Verse 7. <laughs> what do you do? They signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Why is that in here? Because it actually happened. What does that mean for your life? Can God provide for your needs? <laughs> I've heard it said, God, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And that's true. But God owns the hills. <laughs> God owns the earth that the hills are in, that the cattle are on. God owns it all. Oh God, I wish that you had it in your power to help me with my finances. I just wonder if God goes, <laughs> hello. I see when these little sparrows hop. Sparrows, you can buy two of them for a penny. And I think all of you are worth more than that. God cares about you. His omnipotence. Not only does he know where the fish are, but he can get them into the net. That's a big difference. It's one thing, you can have sonar. You can look down and see where all the fish are. That's one thing. But to get them to come up and to move into your net, that's omnipotence. That's all power. How in the world do you get fish to move into a net? Uh, Jesus probably just thought it. <laughs> fish move over there into the net. They go over to school and they just go right into the net. They begin to pull it up and Jesus is just looking at Peter going, oh, I wonder what he's going to think. Well, he already knows pull it up, and they become so excited. It's omnipotence. God holds this world in his hands. I, don't, uh, I worked on a farm with my dad growing up, and we had to get the cattle in to these corrals to work them, and my dad would do the, all the vet work on them. And uh, this one farmer came over to help us one time, and uh, he was going to buy some of the cattle for my dad, and this guy brought something that we didn't have on the farm. He brought a cattle prod. And it was a wonderful thing. And those cattle, they always want to go the exact opposite way you're trying to get them to go. If any of you have ever tried to wrangle cattle, you, try, you want them going over here, they're all going over there. So I used to try to trick them and try to get them to go this way. My dad would say, no, just go around the backside and bring them up to the front. Said, okay. So anyway, got him in the corral, and this guy had this cattle prod, and they were like pushing back. They didn't want to go into the chute. And this guy came up with this cattle prod. He's sticking in about three feet long. It's like a taser. You ever felt one of those before? 
And I tell you what, those cattle began to behave so much better. They just moved right through the chute like nothing was going wrong. If Jesus wanted to get some fish, he could probably shock their little behinds and get them right into a net. Jesus knew how to move animals. And Jesus put those fish right in that net. What happens? So what's the response? Look what Peter does. Simon Peter, verse 8. Simon Peter saw this and he fell at Jesus' knees. And he said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. He fell down at his feet. The biggest catch of fish they've ever received in their whole life. And all Peter can do is just go, you're holy. You're holy. Jesus, I've never seen anyone like you before. There's something different about you. I've gone fishing a lot, but Jesus, I've never... Jesus, you are holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Jesus is holy. Peter recognizes the goodness, the greatness, the holiness of God. And the only thing you can do when you see the holiness of God is to realize you ain't holy. Oh... Oh, can anyone see the face of God and live? What can mortal man do in the presence of God Almighty? He'll die. Peter realizes, I'm in the presence of God in this boat. And he bows down in the presence. Falls at his knees. It's, it's an act of worship in the Greek. He prostrates himself. It's an act of worship that he does right there in the boat. How did Isaiah respond? Remember the vision in, in uh, Isaiah 6, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. <gasps> when you get into the presence of God, you start realizing how unholy you are. And you're crying out for His holiness to be gifted to you. See, none of us, I can't, you can't, we cannot produce our own holiness. We can only receive God's holiness. Psalm 138, too, which you read, I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name, for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you've exalted above all things your name and your word. Peter bows down. Verse 10b, look at that. We're almost done here. Interesting here what happens. Look at this. When he bows down, Jesus says to him, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. The holy God of the universe standing in this boat that's weighed down with fish, and Peter begging for mercy. He realizes he is unholy, and Jesus is holy. What does he do? Jesus could have just said, Peter, get away from me. You are, you are sinful. You are a mess, Simon. Get out of my presence. You're unholy. Yuck. You're making me look bad, Simon. But what does he do? He gives him something we all need. Mercy. <laughs> he says, from now on, you will catch people. In the Greek, it's you will catch them alive. When you catch fish, you're going to eventually kill them and eat them. But when you catch men, you better not do that. You catch them alive. The Bible says you catch them alive. You bring them to Jesus and they come alive. You're going to be catchers of men, not to kill them. You're going to be catchers of men to bring them to the gospel that they might be alive. And then verse 11, what do they do? This is the biggest catch of fish they've ever received in their whole life. Verse 11, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. They left it all. How much money was in that boat? Peter's probably thinking, oh, we can get a new anchor. <laughs> we can get a new net. Oh, we can get some new sails. Oh, we can get some more equipment for the boat. Look at all this money. They leave it all, and they follow the Holy One out of that boat to go catch men alive. To go catch men alive. Alive. <laughs> Five attributes to close. Source of truth. He speaks. It's God speaking. Omniscience. All-knowing. All-powerful. His holiness. And thankfully, his mercy. His mercy. I went to go visit a senior saint the other day, and I said, what's new? And they said, nothing. I said, no. God's mercy is new to us every morning. We have his mercy we have his mercy in our lives. Aren't you glad? He said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Can't you just feel that? Can't you just feel what Peter felt? Oh, oh. 
Jesus. Oh, Jesus. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what I've thought. Jesus, you don't want me around. I'm dirty. I'm filthy. I'm a man of unclean lips. You don't want me around. Oh, Jesus, you're too good for me. And Jesus meets him with mercy. And he says, no, don't be afraid. Come here, you knucklehead. Come over here. I'll clean you up. And I'm going to send you out. And you're going to be catching men alive. I don't know what you've come in here with in your heart. Failure, sin, messed up relationships. I don't know what you've come in here with. But I want to tell you that no matter how bad you feel, God's mercy goes deeper. And God's mercy can pull you in. God's mercy can pull you close to Him and say, Nope, I've got another plan for you. Quit talking yourself down and start listening to my words and you'll be redeemed and on mission for me. Let's stand together.